today's show, I have an interview with Wang Vu, poetry from the Song of Los Gatos, and this month's poetry prompt. Hello, I'm Erica Goss, and this is Word to Word. Today, my guest is Wang Vu. Wang, welcome to the show. Thank you, Erica. Wong Quoc Vu was born in Vietnam and grew up in San Jose, California. He has a Master of Fine Arts degree in Creative Writing from Fresno State University. His work has been published in numerous literary magazines and anthologies, including Ziziva, Poet Lore, and Atlanta Review. He served as editor for Reed Magazine, the San Joaquin Review, and Sejura. In 2012, he began Touraine Poetry Press, where he has since published two collections of poetry and the Perfume River Poetry Review. I'm very happy to have you on the show today, Wong. Um, my first question for you is, when did you start writing poetry? I think with all poets, I think the answer is we've always written it. And so I could remember um, you know, the first things I wrote when I first learned how to write was poetry. And I think that it has to do with, you know, when I was little, my mother would sing lullabies to me. And, mm -hmm. and so I would remember those words. And I love those words and that language. And so when I had a chance to write, I, I did that. So, and, and you're bilingual. You speak Vietnamese and English. Yes. But you write primarily in English. Yes. Can you tell us why that is? And some of your poetry has Vietnamese words in it. And tell me how you negotiate those two languages in your writing. Sure. Um, even though I speak Vietnamese really well, very mm -hmm. fluently, um, I find that I'm not good enough to write poetry in Vietnamese. And so when I do include Poet, uh, Vietnamese and poetry, it's mm -hmm. always in phrases and in short, um, in short lines because I'm afraid that I'm not too good. <laughs> um, I do really like how you use Vietnamese oh, in your you. poetry. It, it adds a lot of uh, cultural richness sure. to your work. Right. Um, and so as you, you are a working poet and um, you're also an editor and a publisher, yes. can you tell us, um, you have some strategies for submitting poetry right. that I think are very helpful. And I know a lot of people watching our show are poets who write often. And can you share with us your strategy for you know, the, the overwhelming process of submitting your poetry? Sure. Right, I, I used to just submit blindly, just sending um, poems out to whatever uh, magazines are are accepting and um, that could be very overwhelming. I mean mm -hmm. you could send out 30, 40 manuscripts um, yeah. a year. Definitely. And so now what I do is I limit it to a dozen literary magazines that either um, I like their work, mm -hmm. um, they've accepted my work, or I know they're the editors. And right. so that limits it to around you know, 12 mm -hmm. that I consistently, consistently send my work to every year. And that lets you develop a relationship Correct. with those editors and they with you. Right. And they get to know your work better and they can probably um, find out, uh, because they've read a number of your poems, they can find out right. where is this poem going to fit in. So it's, I think it's a really good way to right. sort of take that mystery out of submitting sure. that we all go through as right. writers. Because um, it can be really overwhelming. Yes. And you, you send your work out into the void, right? right. You don't know... Where is it going to end up? Sure. Who's going to read it? Um, so I think that's a really smart way of, uh, of doing that. Thank you for sharing that, Huang. Um, how did you get interested in editing? You've done a lot of editing. Right. You've been the editor on several magazines, and now sure. you have your own press. Right. So how did that get going for you? It started at San Jose State, and um, I decided to uh, work on Read Magazine. Mm -hmm. And so I started editing Read Magazine, and I enjoyed it. I loved the editing process, um, having to, you know, reading submissions and then selecting and then building the manuscript. All of those yeah. I absolutely loved. Mm -hmm. And so um, when I went to Fresno State, I decided to continue doing that mm -hmm. a along with writing, which is great. I also wanted to um, edit and publish. And so I worked on the San Joaquin Journal when I was at San Jose State. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. 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 And then you worked at uh, you worked on Reed Magazine, and then you were editor of Sejura. Right. And you produced two um, two editions, and the first one was this one, Brothers and Sisters, right. which is a fantastic, fantastic issue, and it's and it wonderful. Was, it was a great experience yeah. working yeah. on that issue. 
this one, this is one of our, one of po po Poetry Center's bigger issues and it's really fantastic. The other one you did, the last one you did was the end of the world right. and this one was also fantastic and it has this great cover right. that's got, you know, the sunspots. And um, it's in time for 2012. In time for 2012, <laughs> that's right, that's right. Can you talk, can you first talk a little bit, uh, Wong, about editing the Brothers and Sisters issue sure. and how did you get the idea for Brothers and Sisters? Um, I, well, we, we went through a, the, um, the staff and I, we went through a bunch of ideas and what really spoke to us the most was the brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. First, we wanted to do siblings, but then mm -hmm. we thought that that was too limiting and we wanted to have the, the human factor, something more, more touching into it. And so that's why we made brothers and sisters. Yeah, I really like, I really like what, um, what people sent you. It was right. so intimate and yes. so um, there were poems there by people who had no siblings right. and people who had many siblings, people right. who had lost a sibling. Right. A brother or a sister, and um, I really enjoyed reading. I still, I still read it oh, quite you. often. I, I think what I enjoyed most was that people were very sincere, very honest. Because I think that our relationships with our siblings, our brothers and sisters, I think yes. that's one of the most significant relationships we have. I think that's really true. And you come from a very large family. How exactly. many siblings? I, I have thirteen. Oh my gosh. Thirteen siblings. Thirteen, and so I'd say you know something about negotiating the world with yes. many brothers and sisters. Exactly. Um, the next issue that you did was eschatology, was the end of the world, and, and it was timed to, to right. be released in 2012, which we know there was a lot of excitement over right. that. Um, tell me about, about receiving those submissions. What was that like? That was actually pretty enjoyable because some people were really serious about the end of the world. I mean, yes, uh, we had true. quite a few religious poems and poems oh, of people who really thought the world was going to end. Mm -hmm. But at the end, I think the poems that really spoke to us weren't about the end of the world, mm -hmm. but it was more about um, surviving, um, how to um, spend the last minutes with your loved ones. And so there are oh, more yeah. human poems. Yeah, as I really like that about it, is that it, um, the, the, way, the way your team selected the poems right. is, um, it's almost like a story that it moves right. through someone's experience of uh, understanding that the end of the world is coming right. and then realization of what that means. Right. And what would you do if you had five minutes left? Well, I would spend it with people I love or doing the thing that makes the most difference right. to me. So it was actually a very um, uplifting issue. Huh. You know, it, was, it, didn't, right. it, it wasn't um, depressing or scary. At least that was yeah. my no, take I, on it. I, I think at the end, when we looked over our selections, that was what we wanted. We didn't want doom and gloom. No, we no doom wanted, and gloom. Um, you know, how to spend the last minutes with the people that we love. Absolutely, and I think that 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 sensibility imbues the whole issue, right. um, which which is mm -hmm. kind of an unusual take. Right. You know, on yeah. you could have gone real science fictiony, right. or I don't know. There were many different directions that you could have taken. Um, well, Wong, I would like it if you could read some poems of sure. your own Absolutely. for us. Okay. And uh, I think you have four for us right yes. now? Yes. Okay. Um, so let's start with um, In the Vietnamese Language. Great, great. Choice. And this is one of those poems that I, I wanted to honor my heritage, honor um, my, um, my Vietnamese heritage. In the Vietnamese Language. In Vietnamese, apple is gua tao, which translates as apple fruit. The word for apple, tao, by itself is for some reason not enough as if we needed to be reminded that an apple is, in fact, a fruit. This is how other words work. Gon jaw, dog animal, mo vang, yellow color, hoa hong, rose flower, even ngui mea, mother person. Yet there are oddities, chimeras of words. Knife is, strangely enough, gon yao, knife animal, as if it were comparable to fowl, dog, or water buffalo. But it's in these oddities we see that anyone who speaks Vietnamese is a poet. Gon Yao, a knife, might as well be an animal for all it does in the kitchen. A beast of burden, how it cuts like teeth, its gleam like the flash of an eye. Anyone who has spent an hour in the kitchen knows that the knife labors as much as Nguy Mea, who toils over the rice pot. Oh, I love that poem. Thank it's you. just exquisite. Please read some more. Sure. And um, this is another one of my Vietnamese poems. And I've done quite a few readings. And this one, um, I've consistently included it. Mm -hmm. And I've even started my readings with this one because I think that a lot of my work is grounded in, in this poem. Great. Good and it's sure. called 
fried chicken. My family arrived in America late November 1979. Autumn had made way for winter, every leaf fallen, the sky cloudy and raining for days. We were brought to a small house in the suburbs of South San Jose, back then still surrounded by grass fields, farmland, orchards of apricots and plums. The cold had turned the grass brown. Farm fields were little more than withered corn and pumpkin vines, and the orchards seemed dead to us, the acres of them. In the rundown house, there were blankets, some clothes, a small lamp donated by the nearby church. It had never been so gray for us, even in that limbo of a refugee camp, even in those moments of hopelessness, having lost Vietnam as one loses a face or a name, we still had the comfort of sun and warmth of coconut palms by the sea. But here, the gray rain beating on the windows, the cold and those dead trees, we wrapped ourselves up in blankets and sat around the, the lamp and huddled for warmth, the 14 of us, my youngest brother, an infant clinging to my mother. Three days later, a nun from the nearby church came and saw us shivering in our blankets, the small lamp in the center of the room barely keeping us warm, the house smelled of mildew, the cracked walls fell on the carpet like dandruff. And we hadn't eaten a thing, the, growing, the crying children, my infant brother chewing on my mother's breast. The nun took my brother and father to the nearest Kentucky Fried Chicken, that meal of fried chicken, mashed potatoes and gravy, which we thought was an overly rich soup and ate by the spoonfuls, that meal for the 14 of us, cold and hungry, lost and lonely, that meal with wealth of grease glistening on our lips, that breaded chicken, that meal was heaven. I just love that poem, Wong. Of course, it's a food poem. Right. As you know, I love food poetry. Yes. Um, but it says so much about uh, your early experience right. and about the kindness of someone. Right. And um, and I, I really that that poem goes right to my emotional right. core. It's like, um, and I feel that it is an honest representation of an experience through a child's right. voice. And you've preserved that young person's voice, that boy's voice, very very right. well. Wow. Yeah, that was one of the poems that I, I first wrote, and, and I felt that this was a real poem. This was a Vuong poem. Yes. And it felt that yes. my voice was there. Yes, and so I think that's, that's true. So that's one of the poems that I'm, I'm really proud of. Yeah, I really enjoyed yeah. that poem. Please go And um, so um, in addition to my Vietnamese poems, poems about my heritage, I also write a lot about um, eschatology, about death. Uh -huh. about um, you know, how to live life in the face of death. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, this is one of them, Horns and Antlers. Um, and I think this is the, one of the poems that I've read to you, I've shared with you before. I think so too. Horns and Antlers. I drove one summer through the desert on the loneliest road in America. Why I stopped, I can't remember. But there was an abandoned house beside the road. Its roof collapsed, its boards curled by heat. In front of the house, I remember a pair of horns and antlers like branches fallen from a tree. Inside the house, there remained a fallen table, rusted tendrils of bed springs, a hearth stained by fire. I stood in that house with an endless sky as my roof, and the world opened up to me. Petal by petal, the world opened up to me, and I saw a garden and the smallest wildflower that bloomed on the desert floor. I saw there was no death and there is no, there is no loss. There is only shifting sand. There is only the persistence of life that leaves its mark and memory that tells its story. The lonely desert road, the abandoned house, the wildflower, the pair of horns, a branch of antlers. Oh, it's lovely, yes. And so it is, is life in the face of death, this, this house, this abandoned life mm -hmm. in the middle of the desert and mm -hmm. me living there, um, seeing the, the, uh, what remains of this family and right, yeah. moving on because life does move on. Yes, and we all, someday we'll all have to make room for new people, right? right? Otherwise exactly. it would be very crowded here yeah. on earth. So yes, thank you for sharing that. You, I have heard that one, right. poem before and I really like it. And I think I'll end with another death poem. And, and <laughs> it's funny that you brought up the, um, the end of the world yeah. um, issue because this one is called End Times, about the end of the world. Yeah. And I think um, 
growing up Catholic, I was always um, interested, if not obsessed, with the end of the world and, and what it yes. means. There's a religious significance right. to all that as well. Right. And, and now that I'm no longer very religious, um, it takes on a different meaning. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think I hopefully um, conveyed it in this poem called End Times. All right. A man named Thaddeus of Judea claimed himself the new Messiah and the year 44 to be the end of time. He was beheaded by Roman soldiers in the desert and the world did not end. My mother used to tell us as we were falling asleep that at the end of the world, the seas will rise to meet the clouds and fish will eat the stars. In 989, Halley's Comet appeared in the sky like an omen, an apparition, a cloaked star. In 958, Emperor Otto I of Germania took an eclipse to be an apocalyptic sign, and he led his army into holy war. I believed my mother's stories about the end of the world. I believed her stories about Jesus Christ, his second coming, the rumors of war. A Roman priest predicted the second coming in 500 AD, based on recorded measurements of Noah's Ark, Armageddon was predicted for 1666, that is 666, marked unto the thousandth year of Jesus Christ. Jehovah's Witnesses believe the world to end in 1994, 6,000 years they claimed after the creation of Eve to ease Adam's loneliness. The year my father went to war, my mother waited each evening at the train station, the darkening city, the echoes of war in the night, and the world did not end. New Age believers foresee the end in 2012 based on Mayan calendars. And last year, a German man sued to stop the Hadrian Collider, believing that it would create a black hole and darkness to swallow us all. My mother remembers still the meteoric light and the approaching roar of the train the night my father came home from war. My mother used to tell us, as we were falling asleep, that at the end of the world, the only stories that will matter will be love stories. Thank you, Wong. That's a lovely poem, and a, what a great ending line. You know, yeah. it's, it's a fantastic way to wrap things up, right. and it, it really does, that poem reflects the whole sensibility right. of, of the end of the world issue, right. I think. The only thing that will matter is, did we love each other? Right. You know, did exactly. we have somebody love us? Right. That's really what matters. Right. And, and I was hoping to juxtapose <laughs> um, the, the religious um, uh, historical mm -hmm. references with human references. And yeah. I think that yeah. the human references ended up being more powerful, more yeah. something that we carried away from the poem. I think that's, that's really, um, a, that's evident in the poem right. that um, we all have our, we have to have, make some sense of that idea that the world could end. Right. Even as small children, I mean, I remember being told that in four billion years the sun would suck up the earth. Right. And I remember thinking, what a crazy idea. Yeah. You know, it was probably in first grade when it first occurred to me that right. the earth wouldn't be here forever. And yeah. that's very frightening, yeah. you know, for children. So, and once again, um, you have such an innocence in those poems that deal with such huge issues. Wow. It, th but there's a, there's a sweetness and an innocence wow. about it that makes them even more powerful. I, I, I didn't realize that. Thank yeah. you for telling me that. I think, yeah, that, I, um, I think that's the, the voice that I've, been, that I've been getting at all these years. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because one of the things I wanted to ask you, um, you told me that when you went to Fresno, you were looking for your voice. Right. And, and that's the thing you really wanted to find. Do sure. you think that you found it there? Um, I think so. I think so because um, one of the reasons why I decided to go to Fresno State was because um, I wanted to get away. I wanted to do something different. I didn't want to just um, be with family and friends and people right, I've known. Right. And so when I was out in Fresno, um, I didn't know anybody. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't speak to anyone for quite, quite a while. And I was surrounded by you know, all this farmland. And so for the first time, there was silence. Mm -hmm. And so in that in those moments of silence, I think that that voice just got through. I think, and that's so important to know that silence is required for um, for discovering who you are right. as a writer. And you grew up in this big family, Absolutely. and I'm sure there were always things happening. Right. And so you had to remove yourself from sure. your home and let that voice approach you right. and, and welcome it in. Right. And, um, and I really like how you phrased that. Um, we just have a little bit of time left. Wong, can you tell us a little briefly about Torain Press? Yes. Um, I 
decided that I wanted to start my own poetry press because I, um, one, was frustrated with, with submitting and getting rejected. And also I saw that there was a lot of great poetry out there in the community. Absolutely. And so I wanted um, writers to have a chance to, um, to voice their poetry. Mm -hmm. And so I was lucky enough to publish two really excellent collections of poetry. One yeah. was by Megan Bohegian, a Fresno poet. Mm -hmm. And her book that I published was called Sightlines. And oh, yes, it was excellent. Right. Yeah. And the other poet that I published was Mark Heinlein, Mark and a, a, a local um, Bay Area poet. And his book is Everything We Call Ordinary, which is um, a book of uh, prose poetry, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. was excellent. And yes. so I'm glad that I was able to get their voices out put their voices out into the world. Yeah, and, and that's, um, I think that should really be the point of your press, right. um, of anyone's press, sure. not your specifically Wong, but, but that um, there are so many more voices in poetry, local voices and voices of different cultures right. and the blending of cultures sure. that we have here in the South Bay that are so deserving and so need to be heard and they change how you view the world, right? right? Poetry changes everybody. Exactly. When they, after they hear it, they're, they're subtly shifted into another universe. Mm -hmm. And um, the universes that we have here, um, it's wonderful that you're giving them a voice a place, and a place for someone like me to come along and mm -hmm. discover those voices. Right. So, um, well, Wong, I want to thank you so much for being my guest today. I really enjoyed having you and it was lovely to hear your poetry. Thank you, Thank Erica. you so much. It's a privilege to be here. Student writers of poetry often need help getting better at cultivating images that show rather than tell. One of my favorite poets is Theodore Ruthke, a poet who mastered that aesthetic. A good introduction to Ruthke's work is found in the American Poets Project volume, Theodore Ruthke Selected Poems, edited by Edward Hirsch. Ruthke, the son of German immigrants who grew up amidst the greenhouses his father tended near Saginaw, Michigan, wrote verse that, as Hirsch writes in his excellent introduction, put language under intense pressure and developed a strange, highly kinetic, radically associative method. Here are a few examples of this technique in Ruthke's poems. All are from The Lost Son and other poems. Sticks in a drowse droop over sugary loam. That's from the poem Cuttings. Bulbs broke out of boxes, hunting for chinks in the dark, which is from Root Cellar. Thick and cushiony, like an old-fashioned doormat. That's from the poem Moss Gathering. I have known the inexorable sadness of pencils. That's from the poem Dolor. And Deep in the Brain, Far Back is from Night Crow. Ruthke's classic poem, The Waking, uses the villanelle form to create what Hirsch describes as a direct presentation of the unconscious making itself known. Read Ruthke's poems. Try putting words under intense pressure. What does that mean to you as a writer? Let your mind go where it might not have gone, but must in order to create fresh work. Let dreams linger and take your waking slow. I'm very happy to have three poems to read uh, for today's show. These are all from the Song of Los Gatos, which is uh, the new anthology created by the former Poet Laureate of Los Gatos, Parthenia Hicks. And um, this is a fine, a fantastic collection of 140 poems written by and uh, by Los Gatos, by Los, about Los Gatos, by Los Gatos residents and others. All the poems are about Los Gatos. The first two poems I'll read are in the section titled Cats. The first one is called Small Happiness and it is by Beth Phillips Brown. To wake, stretch and bask cat-like in the winter sun, streaming, steam, streaming like honey through the window. A small happiness, but happiness all the same. The next poem is titled Cats and it's by Nick Butterfield. I have a cat, but I have never seen a mountain lion. Even the brave Spaniards, as well as the fool, were afraid of the snarling sounds they once heard coming from the hills of La Rinconada de los Gatos. My cat will sometimes attack me suddenly. It happens while I am petting or playing with him. 
There is still some wild left in him. I too am brave and sometimes a fool. The third poem is from the section titled Contemporary Life, and it is written by Mary Lou Taylor. After dark in Los Gatos. Cats are not the only ones who prowl. Traffic on main streets grows heavier. Lights brighten the way past neon bars. Coffee houses still open, all on active duty. Open doors beckon to walkers. A carousel of jewelry, bicycles, furniture, shoes, flushed with brilliance, flushed with color. Neighboring cities haven't far to drive to hit the action that's Los Gatos after dark. In many towns, stores on Main Street's dim, a movie theater gone long years ago, eateries the only glow. It's strange to walk the silent towns, street lights an eerie yellow, flower baskets faded by the missing sun. Eager crowds gather in Los Gatos town. At night, cross and recross streets, celebrate, congregate, make the most of the welcoming place that's after dark in Los Gatos. I'm pleased to announce that the long-awaited anthology of poems about Los Gatos is now available. Song of Los Gatos contains poems written by Los Gatos residents and others about our wonderful town. If you would like to order a copy, please send an email to me at ericagoss at comcast.net and I will instruct you on how to purchase the book. It is 140 pages long and sells for $15, and it really is a wonderful collection of poems about Los Gatos. You can purchase my new book, Vibrant Words, Ideas and Inspirations for Poets, from Amazon, and the book is also available at Village House of Books in Los Gatos and at Booksmart in Morgan Hill. You can still purchase a copy of my chapbook, Wild Place from Finishing Line Press on Amazon at Village House of Books in Los Gatos and at Bookshop Santa Cruz. The Los Gatos Museums of Art and History are moving in 2015 to a new and larger space in the Los Gatos Civic Town Center. Once the space is remodeled and reconfigured, the museum will expand its role as the backbone of local arts and culture in Los Gatos. Send your poem to me at ericagoss at comcast.net and I will choose one to read on the air. The Poetry Podcast is available at the Poet Laureate blog, losgatospoetlaureate.wordpress.com. Word to Word is made possible by viewers like you, Rainbow Graphics and Video, and KCAT. Thank you for watching. Thank you.